Good morning, brothers and sisters. We are so glad to be back with you as we continue to look at the book of Proverbs and what it means to walk with wisdom each day of our life. We are going to look at another theme in Proverbs and that being the topic of how to deal with conflict. Specifically today, we are going to ask the question, how do I deal with conflict in my life? Now what I know as we approach this topic is that conflict is inevitable. If we're real, we know that life is messy, we don't agree on everything, and we all have different opinions and preferences and experiences in life. But the way that a wise person responds to conflict runs in stark contrast to that of a fool. So as we begin this morning, I want to take a look at what the Proverbs have to say about this. And then we're also going to take you into the New Testament and look at what Jesus himself had to say about this and look at what scripture says about conflict within the church. So as we go to the book of Proverbs today, listen as I read stanza after stanza, many verses about peace and conflict. Proverbs 10 verse 12 says, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Proverbs 12 verse 20, deceit is in the heart of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace, have joy. Proverbs 13:10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 15 verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15:18 says, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Proverbs 17, 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Proverbs 17, 9, whoever loves a quarrel loves sin, but whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. And the last one, Proverbs 20, verse 3, it is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Now, those were several verses, several Proverbs throughout this book. And as I read them, I know for myself, I felt very convicted. And can we all just be honest this morning and say, we are all guilty of living the life of a fool? We are. Every person in this world is because we were born into a sinful world. We were born into a sinful nature. Now, there is a great difference between the man of peace and the man of conflict. And the Proverbs tell us that it is wise to live in peace and not to stir up conflict. But why? Why does Jesus want us to live in peace and resolve conflict in our relationships? So we're gonna bring this into our life as well as the life of our church. Why is this important and how can we deal with conflict? So continue on with Pastor Jonathan. He's gonna take you into the New Testament and show you why this was one of Jesus's greatest desires for his church. Do you know what Jesus did the last night that he was on this earth before he was crucified? He actually called his disciples to come with him to the Mount of Olives, and he asked them to pray with him, but they proceeded to fall asleep. And Jesus, all alone, goes off by himself, and he pleads and he prays with the Father, even to the point of the excruciating pain that he was going through, realizing what was to come, praying and dripping with drops of blood coming down like sweat from his, from his body. 
And here was part of his prayer, this very intense prayer that I believe is very important for us to, to go to as we introduce our topic for today, that of peace and conflict. How do we deal with conflict in our lives and within the church? Here was Jesus's heart. Here was his prayer for his people and for his church. He said this, I do not ask for these only. This is John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. That's you and that's me. Through their word, that they may also be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Wow. Just consider for a moment the importance of Jesus' words here. He didn't pray for his disciples to start a big church or lead many people to Christ. No, his prayer, his earnest prayer to the Father was that they be one. So as we begin today, let me just ask the question, why is it important that we live in peace? Why is that important? The first reason, we just looked at it. Jesus prayed for it. That is the heart of our Savior. It's the strongest prayer in the Bible. According to Jesus, the most important thing he asked for the Father while he was on, on this earth was he wanted us to live as one. Why? For the credibility of our witness and for the sake of the gospel. That the world might believe that you, God, sent me, Jesus, to be the Savior of the world. And not only did Jesus pray for it, that's, that's number one reason. Number two, Scripture commands it. Let's consider that this morning. Scripture commands it. I want to take you to a couple passages in the book of Romans. The book of Romans says uh, in chapter 12, verse 16, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not, um, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. As we talk about wisdom from the book of Proverbs in week one, we see wisdom comes from fearing the Lord, that we're all submitting to God. We're, we're, we're fearing him. Uh, Philippians chapter 127, yes, this is a great example. It says this, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of your affairs. That's what they did. You know, the, their everyday uh, life and what they did and, you know, how they went about their business, how they spoke with one another, how they related with one another. I may hear of your affairs and that you stand fast in, get this, one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Scripture commands it. Jesus prayed for it. Are you getting God's heart when it comes to living in peace with each other? Well, here's where we're going to spend a lot of our time this morning. I want to also look at how the early church practiced conflict resolution and, and, and what they dealt with. See, the, the early church, I believe, practiced the heart of Jesus in his, in his prayer there before his crucifixion. They heard what Jesus prayed. They heard what the apostles taught. And here's what they didn't do. They didn't just say, well, that's, that's ideal, but it's not reality. No, they actually took Jesus' prayer for us at face value. And I think we should too. They said, they said God said it, and so I, I need to be about it. I need to obey it. I, we need to strive for peace. That's what we need to do. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, this is the beginning of the church. It says that day by day, they were continuing with one mind in one spirit, um, sorry, with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity in heart. That was the early church. And Jesus, Jesus' disciples communicated to them and they founded the church upon this principle that there is nothing more important to the heart of Christ than our oneness, than that we're getting along with one another, 
that, that we're authentic, that we're sincere, that we're genuine. And, and it was legitimate. It was real. And they practiced it every single day with one another. And here's what happened. The church grew. The church grew. By, by Acts chapter 4, if you look through the book of Acts, it says that, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so by Acts chapter 4, there was probably eight to 10,000 people that were part of the early church. Let me tell you, the way that they lived together was not this, ah, oh, let's just, you know, let's, let's live in peace. Let's all hold hands and let's sing Kumbaya together. No, this was genuine. It was real. This was the deepest level of peace and unity. And it came not because there was not conflict. Uh, I want you to understand this. It came not because there was not conflict. It came not because people did not have their own opinions. Actually, you see a lot of that in the early church. You see a lot of conflict going on. But wait, what they decided was that our unity in Jesus Christ as Lord and our unity of the spirit in the bond of peace is more important than who's wrong or who's right. We're going to work it out. And we're going to live in peace with one another because Christ has made peace with us and with God. And so, so a real key point that, that I want you to get as we explore this topic of, of conflict, how to deal with conflict in your everyday relationships, is, is, is the big thing that, that God is all about unity. But he's not just about unity. Thing that you need to realize is he's, he's about unity, not uniformity. God is all about unity, not uniformity. God's desire for the church, God's desire for you and for me, is that we take our differences, our personalities, our backgrounds, where we've been, and we, we blend them all together into something that is, that is beautiful and that has impact. Has the church always gotten this right? No, I think more than often, they usually get it wrong. But in Christ, what we see is that um, we have potential for such unity that's based upon something that is outside of us, and that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, in the early church, what you see is that there was right away this struggle for unity because there were people in the church that, you know, hadn't been a part of their religion in the past. You know, what, what Jesus had come and done was, was he had called both Jew and Gentile into a relationship with him. And before, it was just God's chosen people, the Jews, that were part of, part of temple worship. They, they would go to the temple and they would sacrifice animals and they would make, they would make their peace with God. But now, something had changed. God had made something new through his son, Jesus Christ. And so no, no matter what your race or your nationality or your background or your social status or your upbringing, all were welcomed into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I want to read a passage for you, and I think it's actually really key for us to understanding how we relate to one another within the church. It actually comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. It's a little bit of a longer passage, so bear with me and, and just listen in to what, what's happening because it describes a conflict and the resolution that they found in Jesus Christ. It begins by saying this, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, that was not a positive thing, <laughs> positive term that they were be, being referred to by what is called the circumcision, the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See, see the situation that they were in was that the Jews thought that they were the only ones that could be made right with God. And the Gentiles, and, and you and I would be as non-Jews, Gentiles, um, there was no way for us to be reconciled to God before Jesus Christ. 
We were not a part of that original covenant that was made with the Jews. But in Christ Jesus, the promise to Abraham was fulfilled that through him, all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And that was Jesus Christ who came down and lived a perfect life and redeemed us, reconciled us back to God. And so that's, that's what this passage is communicating. The, the struggle in the church was, are the Gentiles included or not? And what he's saying is, um, actually, before, no. But now, yes. In Christ, he has made something new. Here it goes on, verse 14. Ephesians 2.14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, and this is important, one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, and thereby killing the hostility. See, what God was after was not two separate groups of people. He wanted one new man. One new man. And it goes on, verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is being joined together and grows into a temple, a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What's God's desire? What's God's desire for his church? One new man. One new man. That's God's desire. Let, let me just say, say this so, so you understand this. God is not colorblind. Um, we're all supposed to be different. He's created us uniquely different. We're supposed to have our own unique personalities, our own likes and dislikes, and our own culture, and, and our own music. But we're all unified in one man. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 7 says, And I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and, and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's Revelation 7 verse 9. It talks about all nations, all peoples, all tribes, all tongues coming and bowing down and worship to God. That's the kind of unity that Jesus longs for in his church. And it, it transgresses all social, economic, racial boundaries. All of it. Because we're playing to one song. I, I, I love this illustration. Let me just take a second to explain it to you. If you've ever been to an uh, uh, orchestra and, and seen, seen a, a concert done by an orchestra, you'll, you'll notice that before the, the concert begins, the whole orchestra is warming up and it's just like a, just a big mess of sound. They're all tuning their instruments and, and banging on their drums and, and playing their horns and, and getting, getting things set up. And it's just a whole bunch of discord and noise until the conductor shows up. And he steps up onto his stand and he taps on his, his music, music stand there and silence. Silence. And then what happens next is the conductor begins the song and they start to play. And it's just like a transformation has happened. There's all the same instruments. There's the violin, the viola, you know, the, the oboe, and you know, the, all, all the different orchestra instruments, the same instruments that had been playing before, and there was chaos, and now there's beauty. Why? Because they're playing the conductor's music, and they're following their conductor's lead. <laughs> that, that's what it is. See, the difference is that 
as a church, we're gathered here together. And we're not to play to my lead or to your lead. We're to play to our conductor's lead. We're, we're to play to his music, his word, and his spirit, and the way that he guides us. That's our goal here in a church. See, what we, what we have in the world, if you look around in the world, we have everyone playing their own music, playing their own songs. And so you wonder, you wonder why there's so much chaos in the world. But in the kingdom of God, we're playing his song. And you can use your own instrument. Actually, God created you with your own, own instrument to be used in his orchestra to play his song. To play his song. And there's melody and there's going to be harmony. And there's going to be major and there's going to be minor and tension and resolve and forte and pimismo. And staccato and sustain. I mean, there, there's going to be all that. But because we're playing his song, there's going to be beauty in that. Let me also say this. When we talk about conflict, let me just say, say that conflict sometimes gets a bad rap. Did you know that conflict can also be good sometimes? can be helpful in a relationship, in a team, in a church, in an organization. If used well, if we're thinking in terms of a song when there's major and minor notes, dissidence, all that, when there's tension and when there's, there's clashes that happen in music, what, is, what does that evoke? It evokes introspection. It evokes critical thinking, sadness, confession, reflection. In the same way, I believe in relationships, conflict can do the same thing if we allow it to. It can encourage new ways of thinking. It can encourage helpful questions to be asked. It can encourage trust building in relationships. It can encourage open, open minds. It can beat stagnation. It can open doors for innovation. Conflict can do that, but we've got to submit ourselves to our conductor. See, Jesus prayed for it. Scripture commands it. And the early church practiced it. So as we get practical this morning, let me just let me just ask a second question. How can we restore peace in relationships that are in conflict? How can we restore peace in relationships? Let me just give you a brief class on conflict resolution 101, okay? I'm not going to be able to say it all. But 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 here are some things that that I have learned that have been helpful in dealing with conflict in relationships. Number 1 is this. Refuse to tolerate disunity. Refuse to tolerate disunity. Romans 12 verse 18 says this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So refuse to tolerate disunity. In your relational network, if, if you know that there is a problem with you or with someone else, address it. You know what? One of the saddest quotes that I have ever read in my entire life is from a man named Lyle Schaller, and he he addresses the church after after forty years of of working from denomination to denomination in churches all over the United States and actually all over the world. And after doing a bunch of research, he concluded this saying: On any given day, three quarters of churches. Three quarters of a church's ministry is significantly reduced because of non-productive and destructive conflict. Conflict is severe in over a quarter of those churches. It's so severe that the, the, church, the, the church has to reduce that conflict before it can solve or do anything. 75 churches in America are doing what? They're fighting. They're at each other's throats. And a quarter of them can't even get out of the blocks because they're so focused on each other's throats. Does that sound like the opposite of what Jesus prayed? Man, that's sad. Church, can I tell you this? We will not, we will not be effective 
in reaching people in this valley if we will not be reconciled with one another. If we want people to be reconciled and to find hope and healing in Jesus' name, we need to first practice it and be reconciled with each other and find healing in our relational, relational networks. Church, we're a family. What do families do? What do families do? When there's conflict in relationships in the body of Christ, one of the answers is not ignore it. You know, people say, oh, time heals everything. No, actually, time, time creates scars and wounds and infections. That's what I've seen time do. Don't tolerate it. Deal with it. And on a personal note, can I just say, I want to extend to you, and you know who you are if you've done this, extend to you a personal note of thanks. If you've ever come to me when there's been conflict in relationship, where maybe you've disagreed with me, or we've seen things a different way, or maybe I've hurt you, and you've come to me personally in relationship, and we've been restored because of it, instead of letting that conflict fester, instead of gossiping to others about it, that you had the courage to do that. I want to thank you personally for that. And you know who you are. Let me just say, as a pastor, I want you to bring your questions. And as a church, I want us to, as a church, gather together as a body and restore one another in relationships. We want to be a place of hope, a place of healing, don't we? And it starts with us. So refuse to tolerate disunity. Refuse to tolerate disunity. Number two, embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. Embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. John 16 verse 33 says this, in this world you will have tribulation. Why? Because we live in a fallen world and our hearts are broken and sinful. In our sin, we want to look out for number one. And so we're going to lie and we're going to cheat and we're going to steal and we're going to hurt each other all in an effort to get what we want. And over time, what, what happens is that conflict has a way of dividing and causing deep wounds of distrust in relationships. And it plays right into the enemy's hand. What's, what's the, the major tactic of our enemy? Satan is to divide and conquer divide and conquer. So church, let's just decide right now. Let's embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. And when there's an elephant in the room, let's not avoid it. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's understand it. Let's not avoid problem people. Let's not avoid discussing difficult subjects. See, part of our values, we ask the hard questions. We address the deeper issues. We have the hard conversations. That's important. Conflict is normal. And so we're going to learn to deal with it and not avoid it. We're going to embrace it and we're going to grow from it. That's the beauty of the church. So it's not a question of if it happens, but when it happens, how are you going to respond to it? I love the quote, your response is your responsibility. So let's make sure that we're responding Christ's way to conflict in relationships. Third way that, that, um, that we need to deal with conflict is number three. Let's be the initiator. Be the initiator in conflict resolution. You might say, well, hey, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. And scripture says, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. This is getting really practical. Matthew chapter 5, 23 and 24 talks about when, um, when conflict is not perceived to be your fault, when, when, sorry, when it is perceived to be your fault, what your reaction should be. Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. How serious is unity in God's church? It takes precedence over gathering. It takes precedence over giving, giving of your offerings. Maybe, maybe your tithes. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's um, you know, uh, uh, taking communion. 
Maybe it's even coming to church. Maybe it's even before you sit down in, in a pew that, that, that you're going to that person that, that maybe you've had conflict with and you're working it out before you come and worship Jesus, before you sing these songs of praise every Sunday. That's what it means. So when it's perceived to be your fault, that's what you do. You go. You go to your brother. You drop what you have. You, you, you stop what you're doing and you go and be reconciled. What do you do when it's perceived to be their fault? Well, Matthew 18, verse 15 says this. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now keep in mind, this specifically is talking about when someone has sinned against you. You know, it, this is not an issue of someone just disagrees with you, okay? This is if, if, if someone has sinned against you, maybe, it, maybe it's anger, maybe it's gossip, maybe they've lied about you, maybe they've, they've um, you know, slandered you um, with, with other people. I don't know, maybe they've wronged you in some way. It says if your brother sins against you, Go show him his fault. So when it's perceived to be your fault, you take the initiative. When it's perceived to be their fault, you take the initiative, right? If there's a problem, you take the initiative. The, the health of the body of God's church is more important than who is right or who is wrong and who needs to apologize first. Take the initiative. We've got people... I believe, sitting on opposite ends of the churches in America because they refused to deal with conflict in their relationships. And some of you here, I have observed that you've separated from one another. You won't talk with one another on a Sunday morning because there has been conflict in your relationships. And just know this, that is sin and that dishonors God and it breaks God's heart. And it's the opposite of Jesus' prayer. Go be reconciled to your brother and sister. Do it now. And do it now. See, who's our example in all of this? I believe Jesus is our example. Consider this. Who took the first step with us and God? God did. Who, who, who caused the problem? We did. <laughs> right? Who took the initiative? God. Who left heaven? God. Why? Because we had a problem. We had a problem. Conflict resolution 101. He came. He dealt with the problem. He lived a perfect life. He resolved the conflict between us and God. He made the offer, John 3 verse 16, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Like Christ, we've got to be the initiator in conflict resolution. We've got to be that. Jesus is our example and he is our motivation of what the gospel is. And so let's live the gospel as a church. Let's show the world that we are his followers by extending that same grace that he showed to us. And if you haven't experienced that same grace, it's just as simple as just reaching out and saying, Lord Jesus, save me, forgive me. I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I choose to follow and believe in you. I want to be your child. Jesus is our motivation. And he is our, our example in everything. We praise him for that. Take the first step. So refuse to tolerate disunity. Embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. And third, be the initiator in conflict resolution. Be the initiator in conflict resolution. Number four is this. Deal with you before you deal with them. Okay? Deal with you before you deal with them. Luke chapter 6 is that, that classic passage that talks about the log in your own eye and the speck in your brother's eye. It's, it's kind of a humorous comparison. But what I, what I mean by this is that um, don't be impulsive. Own your part, even if it's only 1%. But, but 99% of that is, is, is their part. Own your 1%. What I mean by this is that um, God, God's word says that you need to repent of your 1%. And you go tell them that you're sorry for your 1%. <laughs> will, they, will they own their 99%? I, I don't know. I don't know. You're not guaranteed that. But your response, again, is your responsibility, right? 
See, we, we don't do what God says because we're just, we're promised results. No, we, we do what God says because he said to do it. Because we're called to live lives of obedience. So get your perspective before you try and give it to someone else. Refuse to tolerate disunity. Embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. Number three, be the initiator of conflict resolution. Number four, deal with you before you deal with them. And number five, meet together as soon as possible and outline the issue. Here's what you talk about. Talk about the what. Calmly, if you can, describe the nature of your conflict, your perspective, what, what the other person is doing to, to cause the disunity. The how. Tell them how it makes you feel. I feel like you hate me. I feel like, um, you know, you, you're, you're seeing me in a way. You're, you're, you're um, spreading lies about me and it makes me feel hurt. Why? Tell them why this is important. The what. What are we going to do to fix it? So the what, the how, the why, and then the what. What are we going to do to fix this? Sit down, talk. Work through things together. Understand one another. Encourage their response and feedback. Write down the desired action to be taken. Set a specific time to, to, to review it, to, to address it again. Because patterns don't happen overnight. Sometimes you got to come back the day later and, and just say, hey, are, are we good? Like, how are you doing with this? Uh, you know, we, we talked about this yesterday. How are you feeling after our conversation? Set, a, set that specific time to address the issue again. And then, then, then decide if it gets resolved. Decide to put it in the past. What this means is you don't bring it up to others and you don't let others bring it up to you. You say, we've, we've resolved it. Okay. It also means that you don't bring it up to that person again because it's in the past. It's dealt with. You know, Jesus, when he, when he forgives our sins, says that, that he removes them as far as the east is from the west. He's not bringing them up in, then even in his own mind. So you don't bring it up with others. You don't bring it up with each other. And you don't even bring it up with yourself. That when those thoughts, those negative thoughts about that person start to come into your mind, you choose and pray, God, by your grace, would you remove them from my mind? We've resolved this. We've moved on. And so, we've, we've said refuse to tolerate disunity. Embrace conflict as normal and unavoidable. Be the initiator of conflict resolution. Deal with you before you deal with them. Number five, meet together as soon as possible and reconcile. Outline the issue. Lastly, this. Let's just get practical here at the end. What have you done all this and still conflict has not been resolved? Because this is a real this is reality. You're not guaranteed that conflict is going to be resolved. If that's you and that's what's happened to you, and if this is a legitimate sin issue in someone's life, follow the guidelines of Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to encourage you to study that yourself, but, but I'll give you a basic outline. It says in Matthew 18 verse 15 that if your brother sins against you, step number one, personal confrontation. You go and you show him his fault just between the two of you. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. This could be an issue where someone hasn't even sinned against you. It could be that they're just living in sin. And they need to hear that, hey, repent, turn back to God, confront them on it. This is, this is every member in the church church's responsibility. It's not the pastor, it's not the elders. This is every member in our responsibility to one another. Personal confrontation. Step number two, small group confrontation. Verse 16 says, But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established on the basis or testimony of two or three witnesses. Go back with someone that's objective. Say, hey, we've got to get this resolved. Don't continue to walk in sin. Don't continue to do this. It's dishonoring to the Lord. Step number three, let's take it to the church. If he refuses to listen to them, it says in verse 17, tell the church. Tell the church. So that we as members of the body of Christ can also 
be encouraging. We call it the velvet vice of grace, where we come in love to this person. We say, hey, repent, reconcile, no longer walk in disunity. This, this, this is breaking the heart of God. Don't do this anymore. Okay? He refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if, then he refuses to listen to the church, even to the church. Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's how serious it is. If they refuse to listen to the small group, tell it to the church, bring it before the spiritual leadership of the church, bring it to the church's members, and if he refuses to listen to the church, what's the last point? It's to conclude that they don't understand the grace of God. They have never received the grace of God because they are unwilling to walk in unity with another brother, to forgive another brother of their sin, or to continue just walking in disregard to their own. If he, if he refuses to listen to them, what's the last step? Excommunication. Treat him as you would a tax collector. Can I just say that's hard? That's really hard. And that's how important unity is. In conclusion, can I just say this? God's desire is for us to live in the same unity that he bought for us by his blood. That we live in unity with one another and with God. And we live in that out of response. Is it easy? No, it's not. It takes hard, it takes hard work. It takes, it takes frank conversations. And it takes giving. Giving what you've received from Jesus away to others. Psalm 133 verse 1 says this, How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity together. Let me ask you, do you want our church to grow? Do you want to personally grow? Do you want our church to thrive and to be blessed by God? Do you want to thrive and be blessed by God? Do you want, do you want to be a light for this community? Do you want to enjoy coming into a body do you want to answer Jesus' prayer? Then let's live in unity with one another. Let's be one as Jesus prayed. Thank you for joining us again this morning, church family. Let's come together and be followers of Jesus that pursue peace over conflict. And let's start that off again this week by going to the truth of God's word. Remember to check out your daily reading plan this week and let us know what you're learning, what proverb stands out to you and how you're challenged by it. We look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless.